Thank you, Ron. Okay. Hey, uh, thanks all of you for uh, making some time today. Uh, I look forward to talking about things that are that are on your mind. I, I do have a couple of things I'd like to uh, describe up front to get you oriented to what uh, U.S. Army Europe is doing uh, in the current security environment. Uh, the map that's provided to you um, is not meant to insult anybody's intelligence of uh, European geography, uh, but it's useful for me as an old person when I look at the map, you know, uh, remembering things like Kaliningrad as a piece of sovereign Russian uh, Federation territory or reminders about Crimea, Georgia, and so on. So it's a reference for you to keep. Um, it's something that we use all the time. Um, what I'd like to do, in fact, is use that map to sort of talk you around the current security environment, how we see it from U.S. Army Europe. Uh, we have 30,000 American soldiers, U.S. Army, that are uh, U.S. Army Europe. Um, and, and so uh, we work as part of U.S. European Command. We're the land component under U.S. European Command. General Breedlove is my, my boss uh, in Europe. Three aspects to the security environment uh, in Russia that are uh, different today than what they were maybe a couple of years ago. You know, we all thought that Russia was going to be our partner. Um, the alliance had worked hard with Russia. Uh, but when, with their invasion of Ukraine and illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, that represented a significant change in the environment. And, and of course, it has our allies worried as well as us. Um, you look at the uh, Kaliningrad area specifically, what the Russians have placed up in there, that's inside the green box. Um, a significant amount of uh, capability there. Uh, the most worrisome part is not, not just the fact that it bet sits between Poland and Lithuania, two of our allies, but it has the ability to deny access up into the Baltic Sea um, because of its anti-ship capability, uh, air defense capability, electronic warfare capability as well. Um, and then the, the way that uh, senior Russian officials have talked about Denmark as a nuclear target, Sweden as a nuclear target, Romania as a nuclear target, sort of a irresponsible use of, uh, of the nuclear word, if you will. Uh, you can understand why uh, our allies on the eastern flank of NATO, particularly in the Baltic region, are nervous, uh, are uneasy. Uh, large snap exercises without announcement uh, and so on, these uh, put a lot of pressure on them. Then as you come down to Ukraine, of course, uh, really Europe changed significantly with Russia's uh, invasion of Crimea. Crimea is still sovereign, is sovereign territory of Ukraine, but there are about 25,000 Russian soldiers there now, and the amount of uh, air defense, uh, anti-ship capabilities uh, that are there, the Black Sea Fleet, uh, they have the ability to uh, really com disrupt access into the Black Sea by anybody that they wanted to. That's important to us um, for a variety of reasons, but especially because we have three allies, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey that are on the Black Sea, plus an uh, important partner country like Georgia, which is on the east end of the Black Sea. And uh, what's going on in the east end of Ukraine, the region known as the Donbass, uh, you know, this is an area where we really would like to see a, a political uh, solution there. But the fact is, uh, the number of uh, ceasefire violations that have happened since the 1st of September, several hundred, uh, several Ukrainian soldiers have been killed or wounded in the last few weeks. Um, and uh, the Russian side has not allowed the OSCE uh, to do its monitoring job. So it's hard to have confidence that uh, the rebels uh, or the Russians are complying with the Minsk II uh, agreement. So this is a, a, a part of our concern and what affects the security and stability in the region. Uh, I think you know we have about 400 American soldiers uh, that are in uh, Yavariv Training Center, which is in the west end of Ukraine near the city of Lviv. Uh, this is something that started back in the spring in terms of training Ukrainian uh, interior <coughs> ministry troops. We trained three battalions of them using one of our airborne battalions out of the 173rd Airborne Brigade based in Vicenza. Uh, we just started a new phase here on the 23rd of November where we focus on uh, Ukrainian MOD troops. So we just started the training of five, uh, the first of five Army battalions there at Yavariv. Uh, this process has matured, of course, and so now we have something called the JMTGU, Joint Multinational Training Group Ukraine. Um, it consists of Americans, but also British, uh, Canadian, and Lithuanian soldiers who are helping in the training process there in Yavariv. Uh, 
and um, this also is part of the, the process of providing the, the supplies to Ukraine. Uh, more than $250 million worth of, of equipment and supplies have been provided to the Ukrainian uh, forces. Um, I think it's important when we talk about Ukraine, and I'm, I'm glad uh, that the Vice President was uh, in uh, Ukraine earlier this week to remind everybody, the Ukrainians as well as uh, the rest of uh, Europe, that uh, we have not been distracted by what's happening in Syria, that uh, we still expect Russia to live up to its uh, obligations. Um, and in fact, the rest of the alliance expects Russia to live up uh, to its obligation. Uh, at the Wales summit last year, all 28 nations in NATO agreed that Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea was unacceptable. Use force, change the border of a internationally recognized border of a European country. And that's what Russia did. So even though not every country may see Russia as a number one threat, they all recognize that that was unacceptable conduct or behavior in the 21st century. And so all 28 nations have stuck together. And the EU has stuck together. I think uh, Bundes Chancellor Merkel uh, deserves a lot of credit for her leadership and the EU sticking together. Uh, this is an important symbol to Russia as well. Then as you work your way around to uh, Georgia, uh, you see Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, you remember Russia invaded uh, Georgia uh, in 2008. Still about 20% of the country is occupied by Russian soldiers in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And Georgia has been a very uh, reliable uh, and effective partner, a PFP country. They're the second largest troop contributor for Operation uh, Resolute Support, uh, for the Resolute Support Mission, excuse me, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, more than 30 Georgian soldiers have been killed, more than 240 wounded uh, Georgians. They come without caveat. Uh, they are very good partners for us, and they're an important part of the, uh, of the region. And then finally, the, the last box there on your map just highlights Syria, of course. That's, a, that's CENTCOM's uh, air responsibility. Um, uh, we're interested in, of course, because you see what Russia is doing there. Uh, I believe that Russia went to Syria, number one. They, they wanted to uh, hang on to their foothold there, of air, air base and, uh, and seaport. Uh, they needed to hang on to that before, uh, before the Assad regime fell. Uh, number two, I think they... They felt they needed to demonstrate to their own domestic audience as well as to the rest of us that they're a global power and that um, they have capabilities too. And then number three, they wanted to distract everybody's attention from what they were doing, away from what they were doing in Ukraine. So uh, because of that, we care, uh, we continue to watch uh, what's going on in Syria. But again, that's, that's a different AO from ours. Um, Islamic State. Uh, you know, the, the terrorist attacks in, uh, in Paris, the, uh, the, the uh, other attacks that have happened in Europe, obviously we pay close attention to that, partly because of our own uh, soldiers and families that are stationed there, but also because these are our allies. Um, so we work closely with our host nations uh, in terms of intelligence sharing, information sharing, um, and, and other ways that we can uh, support them. Probably one of the most important tasks that U.S. Army Europe does in Europe is by training with our allies, improving uh, capabilities, and uh, improving interoperability, uh, providing stability. Uh, the U.S. is not in Europe to defend Europe, per se. We're here to defend our strategic interests. Uh, significant economic relationship uh, between the United States and the EU, more than any other part of the world. Uh, secondly, uh, so many of our most reliable allies come are in Europe. Uh, and I think it's clear the United States is not going to go off and do things alone. We're working. Our president has uh, 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 led us to have coalitions, work with allies, work with partners on everything we do. Other countries know things that we don't know. And so our contribution to this effort then is by continuing to improve, build capacity uh, with our allies. And then finally, uh, refugees. The, the refugee uh, crisis uh, is uh, significant. Uh, when you think of the numbers of people, um, I think that the uh, you worry about the impact on on the EU. Uh, the the cohesion of the EU is as important as the cohesion of the alliance, and uh, so you see the nations are are struggling with how do they deal with this flow. Uh, but I have confidence that the EU is going to get this right. Uh, I think they may have to adjust some of their policies um, to help with the information sharing and how they do protect their borders. But um, I I have confidence that the EU will get this right. And uh, uh, 
the ability to protect the Schengen zone, for example, the ability to move around inside the uh, alliance is an important part of, of what it's all about. And that's important for us also, for uh, NATO forces to be able to move around so that we can uh, be responsive to uh, a potential threat uh, on the periphery of the alliance. And that really comes down finally to what, what is our role? Uh, at the Wales Summit that I mentioned earlier, one of the key things that came out of that was that the, the Red Insection Plan, the alliance, had to be more responsive. Uh, and, and part of that is creation of the VJTF, the Very High Readiness Joint Task Force that y'all are familiar with. There is a U.S. contribution to the VJTF. Um, but our, our contribution to this is increased uh, exercises to demonstrate capability. Uh, you know, we now depend on a uh, rotational brigade that comes out of, uh, currently comes out of Fort Stewart, Georgia. Uh, about two years after the last tank left, we now have an entire brigade of, uh, armor brigade of equipment uh, is back on the ground in Europe. It's going to stay there. So even when the unit goes home, the equipment will stay in Europe. Some of it's going to stay in Lithuania, Romania, and Bulgaria. The rest of it will be in Germany. The troops will come back in the spring. They'll draw it out again, and we'll train with it all next summer. That equipment is called EAS, European Activity Set. I think you're familiar with that. Secretary Carter announced that earlier this year. Um, that's an important part of our ability to respond to actually uh, prevent a crisis from happening. The sooner that um, we can identify a potential crisis, the sooner we can get a decision, the sooner uh, forces could assemble somewhere, the better chance we have to prevent a crisis from actually happening. And that's what the Wales Summit was all about. Um, to, to help us prevent a crisis, to improve our deterrent capability. And then finally, um, I depend on the reserve component. Uh, the National Guard with the State Partnership Program, 22 um, states matched up against 21 different countries in Europe. Um, it, it extends our uh, reach, if you will, not 30,000 soldiers. We've got to create the same effect we did when we used to have 300,000 soldiers. Um, of assurance and deterrence. And so the National Guard, uh, in a variety of ways, is very helpful there. Uh, gives us access. They have relationships. Uh, we had uh, Alabama engineers in Romania all summer, Tennessee engineers in Bulgaria all summer, um, Illinois with Poland, California um, is state partner with Ukraine. So I have a California National Guard colonel as the commander of our training mission in Ukraine. So this is real substantive uh, contribution by the National Guard. Of course, it's not free. Uh, so we depend so much on ERI, the European uh, Reassurance Initiative, which is paid for with contingency funding. That's how we're paying for all of our rotational forces, and that's how we're paying for a lot of the uh, expanded use of the National Guard and the Army Reserve. Okay, so with that, um, I, I look forward to any questions you might have. And if you don't have any questions, I do want to say Merry Christmas. And also, I hope that you will come over and visit us in, uh, in Europe. I'd love for you to see what our guys are doing in um, Eastern Europe, Ukraine, and so on. Leader. Um, General, thanks for doing this. Um, I had a couple of quick sort of factual questions and then sort of a broader. Um, first, you, you mentioned substantial, I, I think you used the word, uh, significant capabilities uh, along the gap between um, the Baltic states and Poland. C can you be a little bit more precise on what that um, significant capability is, um, and then um, more broadly on Russia, Ukraine. You sort of offered the thought about uh, Russia going to Syria almost as a distraction uh, to get people's eye away from what was going on in Ukraine. I'm wondering if, if the uh, opposite is also true. Has Russia's increased involvement in Syria taken anything away, do you think, from its um, activities in Ukraine? Have you seen any lessening of focus on Ukraine, or have you seen the numbers along the border, on um, the eastern border of Ukraine, stay the same, build up, et cetera? So uh, to the first part, uh, in the what we call the Sewalki Gap area, which is that 95-kilometer stretch between uh, Kaliningrad and Belarus, um, you know, there's a significant or a large Russian training area in Kaliningrad, and there's a large Belarusian uh, training area there in the northwest corner. Um, the Russian SNAP exercises, uh, you know, one of the things that separates us from them is transparency. You know, we, 
We comply with the Vienna Protocol. If there's a certain size exercise, you have to invite the other Russians to come be observers. I've, we've had Russian observers in Bulgaria and Hohenfels here just in the last few months. Uh, the Russian SNAP exercises, you know, there's never an observer there. Uh, we, we find out about them when they're happening. And so that kind of uh, capability that they have where you could show up in a uh, training area in Kaliningrad or Belarus or maybe both at the same time, uh, you could see that's a that's a threat, a concern that we have because of the lack of of transparency. So that's one aspect of it. Kaliningrad itself, of course, it's sovereign Russian territory, so they can put whatever they want there. Uh, but what they have there in terms of any ship capability, uh, they have exercised uh, putting a Skander missile there. Um, the uh, part of the Baltic Fleet, part of uh, or they have air cap air force capability there. Um, the uh, Air defense uh, is, I say, significant because the numbers change based on exercises and forces coming in and out of there, and I wouldn't want to put a specific number on there, but just but let me say that um, they have the capability that they could make it very difficult for any of us to get up into the Baltic Sea um, if we needed to uh, in a contingency. As far as um, what, what their capabilities or capacities are in Ukraine now, um, of course, what they've got in Crimea is significant. And one of, one of the things that, you know, we're constantly looking at is what, is what is their capacity? How much are they able to sustain? How much are they able to do? I, I don't know the, the full answer to that yet. Um, I suspect that, you know, a big chunk of their military is, is still, um, you know, they're, they're trying to make the transition from, from a conscript army to a professional army, but they do have a, a portion, and I don't know exactly what that portion is. It's very capable, very modernized, NCOs carrying secure radios, um, electronic warfare capability. I think that part gets used in a lot of different places. I just can't tell how much they're moving the same guys around. Uh, what they did do in Ukraine um, before, uh, or at, at the conclusion of Minsk I was a, a significant training effort of the rebels, a lot of combined arms training. There's a lot of equipment there, and without having uh, OSCE's special monitoring mission able to do all that it's supposed to be able to do, I can't tell for sure how much is still in there, uh, but the kind of things that the, that the Ukrainian soldiers are facing is not stuff that gets assembled in your in your mother's basement. I mean, there's high-end electronic warfare capability, rocket launchers, volumes of ammunition, uh, tanks with reactive armor, uh, and uh, other protective capabilities. It's, that's what I mean when I say significant. Um, the the percentage of Russian military that's in I don't know the exact percentage of their capabilities that are in Syria but they definitely have the ability to, to do both, should they need to. Uh, I'm sorry, just as a, as a follow-up, though, in eastern Ukraine, since the ceasefire, are you seeing the Russian numbers along that border go up, go down, increase capability or decrease it, capability? Well, the, 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 the units vary. Uh, what's what stayed there, though, was infrastructure, and that's what takes a long time. You can move units in and out, but if there's infrastructure there, um, places to go, for example, command and control infrastructure. That's the part that takes a little bit longer time. That's still there. Yes, sir. Thank you, General. <clears throat> Dan Parsons with Defense Daily. Okay. Um, based on what you understand that the Russians have uh, along their western flank, do you are you equipped with the appropriate technology to deter their capabilities? Could you discuss the comparative ability, as far as you know, of our ability to transfer and concentrate when and where needed in times of crisis and also if you could just speak to the interoperability of our equipment and units with uh, our allies in the region please that was like 19 questions man Sorry. <laughs> i'm teasing um all right so first of all uh indicators and warning i think is the first thing you're talking about on the on the front end there um the uh focus of our intelligence effort, obviously, for the last 12, 13 years has correctly been in the Middle East, uh, in, in Africa, in, in Korea, but especially in the Middle East where, you know, you've got soldiers deployed that are actually in the fight. So correctly, our intelligence focus has been there. 
uh, that's that's one thing. So now, uh, and also, by the way, the training of uh, linguists, you know, Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers, and so on. Uh, we've been cranking out Dari, Arabic, and Pashto speakers. So we're having to re, uh, regenerate some uh, linguist capability. And that's another place where the National Guard comes in real handy and the Army Reserve because you've got a lot of first and second generation uh, immigrants from those countries that, you know, speak the language. And, and so we're getting some help there. Uh, but the other capacities, um, you know, you can't just fly over Russia um, with uh, the same kind of aircraft that we use, uh, say, for flying over places in the Middle East or for collecting capabilities. So, um, you know, we're playing catch up a little bit. Uh, you can feel it. The entire intelligence community is, is moving out on this. Um, but it, it does go to capacity and, and prioritization. And uh, you know, I can feel I can feel it every day that the, uh, the inter intelligence enterprise, if you will, um, is adjusting to trying to meet this requirement as well. Uh, the, the second question I think you're talking about really is responsiveness. Uh, President Putin, of course, has the ability to move troops uh, inside. Um, he has freedom of movement on interior lines because he's moving inside of, of Russia. Um, whereas uh, the alliance is moving across multiple sovereign borders between their EU countries, NATO countries in almost every case. Uh, but still, it's not quite the same thing. So uh, we do uh, a lot of work on improving that responsiveness. That's what the whole readiness action plan was about, improving the ability of the alliance and that kind of environment to bring together uh, units from multiple countries to be able to move and assemble in a place. So it really is about speed speed of identification of what's going on. Are these little green men or is this a dock worker strike? Um, and there's a lot of aspects of being able to identify that. And it's not just platforms, it's about human, it's about um, our, you know, we have soldiers that stay full time in those countries. Uh, the second part of speed is speed of a political decision to employ the VJTF, or maybe it's gonna be a unilateral or bilateral to bring over the, our global response force or to move forward station troops that are already in Europe to an area to prevent something from growing into a crisis. And then it's the speed of assembly. So that's the, that's the physics part. You know, how fast can you get uh, soldiers and equipment either by rail or road movement to assemble somewhere? So speed is really important. All these exercises we're doing, all the work that the Alliance is doing is um, focused on improving speed of recognition, speed of decision, and speed of uh, assembly. That's our best chance to prevent uh, something from growing into a, a real crisis. Now, obviously, uh, a part of this is interoperability. When I went to Afghanistan, I knew almost a year out I was going to Kandahar. So, and I knew that I was going to fall in on an existing communication structure, a place, and people were coming and going. It was there. Uh, now, uh, when you uh, look at uh, what we have, and the, the Russian use of information, which is kind of the leading edge of, you know, we refer to it as hybrid warfare, but they call it new generation warfare. Information is in the fabric of what they do. It's not an add-on thing. It's, it's in the fabric of what they do. So it makes it difficult to tell what's happening. They will not do us a favor of just lining up, you know, tanks on the road like maybe we thought was going to happen 30 years ago. Um, so that means that we have to show up. Units have to assemble on very short notice and plug in and be interoperable. And uh, again, that's what our exercise is about. Part of this is a technology thing that we keep working on, but part of it's NATO standards, NATO procedures. Uh, the, the good thing is that um, almost all the leaders of all the countries have been together for years in Iraq, in Afghanistan. I mean, I had the huge privilege to work uh, for uh, three months under the current, and when I was in Kandahar, my boss was the Dutch Army Chief, General de Cruyff, and then it was General Carter, who's now the British Army Chief. Uh, our, our Chief of Staff, General Milley, had multiple uh, foreign officers serve under him who are now chiefs of their armies. So, I mean, this kind of a, of a network, if you will, of, of allied officers that know each other is doing a lot to improve our ability. Thank you, sir. Yes. Hi, John Johnson with Defense News. Uh, I wanted to ask you, General Vi had said that uh, there will be more activity sets put into Europe um, and that this is about two or three months ago. Um, I wondered where you are in the decision-making process in terms of adding activity sets, you know, where they might go, how big they might be, what types of equipment. Mm -hmm. 
Well, first of all, if, if General Vice says it, you can take it to the bank. Uh, the Army Material Command. Uh, I'm an old guy now. When I was young, I did not care anything about logistics. Stuff just showed up. Uh, now I know why it shows up because people really work hard and anticipate requirements. And uh, the Army has uh, put their shoulder to the wheel on getting us capability back in Europe. So when we say EAS, we're talking about equipment, um, all the equipment of this uh, heavy brigade, if you will. Um, about 1,300-ish uh, vehicles. That includes about 235, 240 tanks, Bradleys, and uh, Paladin howitzers. Um, and uh, we have, we're going to distribute it, if you will. When it's not being used, it will stay in e maintenance facilities, what we call EAS sites, in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, uh, Romania, and Bulgaria. Um, all of those will be complete by the end of 2016. And Frank, ideally by September of 2016. Three of them are done now. So the equipment, as the 1st Brigade of the 3rd Division wraps up this rotation that they're on right now, uh, equipment is going to be left behind in uh, Lithuania, Romania, and Bulgaria. Those were our, the three places where we were first able to get the maintenance contract set and, and, and get it all done. Uh, the remainder will be completed over the course of the coming year. So when the heavy brigade comes back in April, they draw the equipment out, they train with it for six months. When they put it away next September, it'll go into the new sites. So uh, two sites in Poland, Estonia, Latvia. And then I think in 2017, we'll get one in uh, Hungary as well. Um, so that's, I think that's what he's uh, talking about. But you know, it's, uh, uh, when it's sitting for four months, after getting rode really hard for about six months, it needs to be into a maintenance facility so that the, uh, it's ready to go when we come back the next time. So that's what he's talking about. So no plans for any additional activity sets coming? Well, the, what I have offered to the Guard, for example, is say, hey, if you want to bring, if the Guard wants to put equipment in Europe, which I would love, uh, we could put that in, add that to the EAS sets also, to the, uh, excuse me, the EAS sites. So uh, take advantage of that. Um, or it may, it may go into, uh, in Germany, for example, if the Guard uh, chooses to do that. So in that regard, but I don't see additional EAS locations. Now certainly um, we are always uh, looking for uh, the possibility of uh, if the Army is going to put uh, more, equipment in APS, that's the preposition stock for deterrence. EAS is for assurance, APS is for deterrence. Um, that's, you know, we're, we're looking at places for that too, but we don't, I don't have a, a formal decision on that. Thank you, Sebastian Springer with Thanks, Inside Sebastian. Defense. Um, you have pushed for some time to make Atlantic Resolve a named operation with all that it, it entails, funding and force generation. What kind of reception have you gotten from the Pentagon to make it so, and what are the implications if that is not decided? Well, uh, of course, General Breedlove, my boss, is the one who's uh, advocated so strongly for it. Uh, the Army, the Army supports that. I certainly support that. Um, I think this is a decision that um, you know will be made at the right level in the in the Joint Staff. It, it affects prioritization. And, uh, you know, the uh, Joint Staff has to make decisions based on available resources and priorities. So I think that's why we're not there yet. Um, but I, I am confident in the process of what UCOM is doing to uh, contingency planning. Um, and I think that that's moving in a, in a very positive direction. So actually, I feel, uh, I'm not trying to be clever here. Um, I, I, I'm optimistic that we're going to get um, this sort of prioritization that we need. Was that a specific step in place? or I think that's an important symbol. And what's the, uh, to, to quick on, on cost, what's the, proje the projection you have for next year for the uh, European reassurance initiative? Um, do I, I, don't, I don't know what the, uh, and I wouldn't want to guess on a, on a number, what I am confident in is that uh, we're going to have ERI um, through 17. I just I don't know what the exact number is. But again, I, um, you know, this is all new. It, it, it's, I think it's important to remember 
what we're doing now, in the great scheme of things, this is all breaking news in terms of, you know, being back in Europe and what Russia's doing, uh, getting equipment back over here. This is very expensive. So the, for the department to turn as fast as it is, and none of the other things have gotten easier, by the way. It's not like stuff's freed up now because everything's good in Syria or Africa or, or Korea. Yet the, the department is still turning. And I think, you know, the secretary's strong but balanced approach, you know, that, that's what we're talking about is putting teeth into it, having real capability, spending the money. Uh, it, it costs a lot to bring a heavy brigade over here, uh, a significant increase in access to the Guard and Reserve, but doing it in such a way that there's still opportunities to dial it back down so that we're not, you know, creating a problem. Okay, Tara. Tarkov with Stars and Stripes. That's okay. Um, so compared to the spring and early summer, Ukraine, at least from this distance, seems largely settled. Is that actually the case? You know, earlier this year you had suggested that Russia was preparing for another major offensive. Has that largely died down? And then um, secondly, on Turkey, given everything that has happened between Turkey and Russia and Syria, is there any possibility of an additional Patriot battery to be sent there? Uh, first, I, I hope I did not suggest, I don't remember ever suggesting that I think a Russian offensive was imminent, but regardless, um, they have kept the capability there um, to, to be able to do that on, on a very short notice. Uh, it's indisputable that they have got uh, equipment uh, and providing command and control in there. Uh, the, uh, the rebels, the Russian-backed rebels, are, they're not just a rogue gang out there roaming around. Um, I think uh, the vast majority of what they're doing is, is absolutely being controlled uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, from OSCE reporting, not from Ukrainian reporting, or about from the OSCE reporting, there's been over 750 ceasefire violations since 1 September. That, that's, that's huge. Now, not thousands of people, and by the way, they're not all just on one side, but the predominance of them are on the Russian side. Uh, and this is why it's so troubling that the OSC's special monitoring mission can't do its mission. It's hard to have confidence in what's actually going on over there. Um, had an OSCE vehicle recently damaged by landmine. Uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, wounded in combat as well as uh, because of landmines here just in the last 48 hours. So there's, a, there's been a lot of, of um, violence, low level, unless you're the person there, of course. Um, in a large area in the Donbass, all along the line there. So that's a concern. Um, I think you heard General Breedlove the other day said it, you know, it doesn't look like uh, Minsk is going to be fully implemented by the end of the year like it was supposed to. Um, there's supposed to be elections, I think, in February. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a settled situation at all. I wouldn't describe it that way. Now, did, did, I cover, did I address that sufficiently? Um, just one quick follow-up on that. Just say it's not settled, but compared to the spring and summer. Are sure. Okay, that's what you're saying. It's, it's not done yet. It's going to mean where you've got battalions getting hammered with rockets um, all at one time. Uh, and in a lot of places, the heavy equipment has been pulled back. I don't mean to suggest that there's been zero compliance. Uh, I'm just saying it's, it's, in a, it's in a state that's unsettled and that it could be ramped up very quickly should somebody choose to. That's, I think that's the way I'd say it. Um, as far as um, Patriots, I, I think, uh, you know, there's a significant amount of uh, U.S. Air Force uh, that's flying in and out of Interlick. Um, that was, uh, and there are other things that are being done to help um, with, the, with, with the withdrawal of our Patriot um, out of uh, Turkey earlier this year. So I, I think the department and Central Command are doing the right things. To, uh, to to protect Turkey, so I, I'm I don't I'm not aware of any consideration of a battery going back in there. Yes, hey, General Marcus Boyce, hey, Mark. Defense One. Thanks for doing this. Um, to go back to Kaliningrad and the pop-up exercises, can you talk to the frequency of uh, how often <coughs> these exercises are happening, and have you specifically seen the Russians do any type of drill to actually shut down the Baltic Sea? Um. The, the frequency, I mean, these are not happening every week, not on, the, on that kind of a scale. I mean, even they can't, can't nobody can afford that. Um, 
we have seen them do exercises where they, you know, there's a nuclear strike. Uh, they don't they don't say gray land and silver land or red land or stuff like that. They say you know NATO is the adversary when they do their exercises. I mean they're pretty uh, pretty blunt about that. Um, I haven't seen. I personally have not seen a specific exercise where they pull it all together at one time to do just that. They've done lots of the components that would be required to do those various things in terms of air, maritime, uh, land forces, but I haven't seen one exercise that looked like a complete rehearsal for that. When you say nuclear, what, what type of scenario are they are they do against? What, what what type of countries or what uh, type of you know, I'd rather not guess on it or wander too far, wander too far from that. If you'll let me come back to you on that one, I would do that. Okay. Because otherwise I'd be guessing on that specific thing. I can remember bits and pieces of it, but I can't remember specifically and I don't want to guess on it. Hey, Darrell. Um, Christina hey, Christina. Hill. Good to see you. I just wanted to follow up on Lita's question. And so it sounds like uh, the numbers of Russian troops along the eastern Ukraine border has gone down while the infrastructure is still there. Um, can you give us a sense by how much uh, the number of Russian troops have fallen? Because at one point we were tracking it pretty closely. Um, and then also, is and it, 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 if that is directly related to Syria, if those troops have instead gone to Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't want to get into a specific number because it does change um, a lot. I mean, it goes up and down. Uh, the fact that the infrastructure mm -hmm. remains is, allows them to move back and forth. I don't. I don't see a direct connection with, you know, they're having to take from here in order to do Syria. The percentage of their capability that's in Syria is a relatively small percentage, at least of ground troops. Um, I don't know in terms of what capacity of their Navy and Air Forces are there. Um, certainly they have applied a lot, of, a lot of capability there. But I wouldn't see that they're so stretched that they would have to take from here to put there. I do think there's a percentage of their army that is more modernized than say the rest that probably is, is getting extra work um, in order to do certain things, but I don't I wouldn't say specifically that came from there to go there. What do you mean uh, part of their army that Well I mean like, you know, they've invested in the in, the entire Russian army is not top to bottom carrying secure FM radios, got all the latest uh, gear. So the modernization effort that, that's underway is not complete. So probably, um, again, I'd, I'd be guessing, but you know, less than a quarter of the Army is you know, professional, professional NCOs, got all the latest gear, that sort of thing. That's what I'm talking about. And has uh, the threat level uh, for U.S. troops uh, in Europe, has that changed since the Paris attacks or any kind of awareness or safety measures for troops since, since the terrorist attacks? Yeah, I'm sure we're... Um, I think we're doing all the things you would expect us to do and for heightened awareness uh, about uh, doing proper force protection procedures. You know, an important part of us being in Europe is having families there. It's that, it's that commitment, um, and, and we have soldiers there for two, three, four years, so having families there is an important part of that as well. So um, I have a responsibility uh, to make sure that um, our soldiers and families are able to live there, work there, come and go, and do things in a, in a way that's safe. Uh, so critical to that is our ability to share information with host nation, security forces, police, intelligence, and so on. I'm actually very happy um, with the quality and the, and the level of cooperation in that regard. Um, and, you know, for decades. I mean, I remember when I was a lieutenant about 100 years ago, you know, you had to get the briefing on, you know, don't wander around waving a, you know, look at me, I'm an American. You know, everywhere, in, you know, our State Department has the same kind of guidelines. You, you, you try to blend in, not attract attention so that you can go around and you know, we're doing all those things. Um, so, yeah. Sure. Hi, General. Lou Martinez of ABC News. Um, there was an article recently describing uh, complaints from within the Ukrainian military about the, the gear um, that was being provided by the United States to the forces there. Um, have you heard any complaints uh, from them? About the quality of the gear that they're that is being sent to them, only and that they didn't to the level of effort that they need. Only in that one article. Um, I think there's there's probably two or three things about this. Uh, number one, the MOD, the Ukrainian MOD came out and said, "Hey, we like everything we've got. We knew what we were getting." So that I think that that counts for something. Second of all, 
Uh, it would be no surprise to anybody that, you know, you try to do the best you can as fast as you can to get what you can upon request. So maybe the quickest stuff that could have been provided might have been some older equipment. I don't know. But what I see um, from brand new body armor to brand new helmets to uh, millions of dollars worth of medical supplies, the exact same sort of IFAC individual first aid kit that our soldiers use, that's being provided to them. They're being trained on how to use that. Um, and then, of course, the lightweight counter mortar radar, which uh, they used very effectively. Uh, and then the Q36 radar. I saw those things practically brand new at Toby Hanna Army Depot after they were refurbished. Then I saw them in Yavariv just a few weeks later. So uh, I think a huge investment uh, by the United States. Uh, but the most important thing is the, the quality of training. I mean, we had hundreds of soldiers there um, for months helping to train uh, Ukrainians. So I'm, I'm very proud of, the, uh, of what we're doing to help them. And by the way, we're learning a lot from Ukrainians. I mean, they're, most of them are veterans. They, they, I've never been under Russian artillery fire or rocket fire. They have. So uh, we're learning about Russian UAV capability, electronic warfare capability, what it's like to be on the receiving end of uh, smart rockets is not good. Is there discussion about additional like, assets that you can add to, to the Ukrainians? There have been some talk about maybe counter-battery uh, radars or counter-battery equipment being sent to them. Well, of course, that's, that's what those radars are. They got the, the, the lightweight counter-mortar radar and then the two Q36 radar, which just arrived uh, in November, and they're training on those right now. That's, that's what we use is, is Q36 radar. Hi, sir. Ty hey, hey, Tom. USA Today. Can you tell me what your uh, top unmet need is? Is it personnel? Is it is there equipment? What do you have urgent requests for anything in particular? Um, well, I think you know there's a uh, operational need statement for increasing lethality on the uh, striker. So uh, the Army uh, working hard on doing that. The Congress responded very quickly uh, to support us there. So uh, we'll have uh, go from a 20 millimeter to a 30 millimeter gun on the. Uh, on some of our strikers, that will be uh, very helpful. Um, the uh, RFF process, you know, is underway, and um, getting aviation um, is really important to us because aviation is such a. And I'm an infantry soldier. I love aviation. It's such an important uh, enabler. Um, so I, I believe we're going. We're looking at an increase in our aviation capability, but it's going to be rotational. Uh, I don't. I don't see anybody being able to, uh, um, I mean, there's no state that's going to say, hey, why don't you take these 5,000 soldiers out of Fort wherever and restation them in That's just not going to happen. Uh, so the Department of Defense is working very hard to resource us with rotational forces as well as Guard and Reserve. Aviation would be right at the top. Um, and then, you know, there's never enough engineers, you never have enough uh, artillery, but aviation would be at the top. Yeah, Jim. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you may have learned in Trident Juncture last month or maybe a little over a month ago? So Trident Juncture is a, uh, an exercise that we've been doing in Ukraine actually for quite a few years. It was uh, generally done in, as an uh, international peacekeeping type uh, exercise, multinational, hosted, co-hosted by the United States and, uh, and Ukraine. Uh, obviously, in the last two years, the, with a completely different environment, uh, interest in the exercise increased, and uh, uh, so the, it's shifting from being a peacekeeping stability type operation to one with a more uh, operational uh, combat kind of focus. Uh, we'll do it again this coming summer. I think it's in July. I can't recall for sure, but um, uh, more and more countries are joining to be a part of that. Uh, other nations are as interested in Ukraine's capability as we are uh, in their ability to protect and defend themselves. So um, I'm looking forward to a good try to juncture uh, again this summer. The, the Ukrainians um, are great fighters. Um, they are committed. Uh, and I don't want to over, I don't want to oversell this. I mean, there's, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, we're well served with a very good ambassador there, Ambassador Jeff Pyatt, uh, and he regularly reminds Ukrainians, and they can count on the United States, we're here, we're with you, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, we're training. But Ukraine, just like our vice president, also just said, you know, you've got to uh, eliminate or reduce corruption in the government, and that goes to all the ministries as well. So um, that is underway. I can, I can sense that. I've been impressed with the transparency that I get from Ukrainian officers 
uh, when they do an AER, an after action review, when they describe, hey, here's what we've learned, it's transparent and uh, professional in a way that you would expect from an American or British or a German officer, uh, which is very reassuring. I've also been impressed uh, with, uh, I've had a chance to meet members of the RADA, the uh, Ukrainian parliament. Uh, they are very interested in transparency, what we would recognize as congressional oversight. Uh, and so the George C. Marshall Center in uh, Garmisch, Germany, um, has run courses for them, seminars for them, where you had uh, officials from the ministries as well as from the RADA uh, participate, where you talk about transparency. Um, so that's, that's encouraging to me. Um, to see them uh, working on that. Now, and again, the vice president, I thought, was very clear about the importance of that. So what does that have to do with rapid trying it? I think my point is you see uh, an army, uh, Ukrainian military, that's in the middle of a fight. Uh, it has stopped Russian-backed rebels. Uh, 